known for over half a, uh, half a century that DNA contains the blueprints to make all living things. Almost 15 years ago, scientists sequenced the first human genome. And today, for just a few hundred dollars, you can have your own genetic information decoded. The genome can tell us a lot about ourselves, about our ancestry, our traits, and our disease susceptibilities. But there are things in the genome that you might not want to find out. For example, with two misspelled versions of a gene called APOE4, your chance of developing Alzheimer's disease is more than 10 times above average. And with a single diseased copy of the Huntington gene, you're virtually guaranteed Huntington's disease, a devastating form of neurodegeneration. And in both of these cases, there aren't currently any effective prevention or treatment options. And so this leaves many wondering, is this information even worth knowing? Well, what if we could do more than just learn that information by reading the genome, but actually rewrite the genome to cure genetic diseases at their source? What if editing the letters of DNA were as simple and easy as fixing typos in Microsoft Word? This is no longer science fiction, thanks to a new tool called CRISPR-Cas9. In the last three years, scientists have delivered CRISPR-Cas9 to human cells and precisely fixed the genetic mutations that cause cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, and Huntington's disease. Genome editing in animals and cells is teaching us more about how cancers progress and revealing promising new drug targets. And companies have already raised almost a billion dollars to apply CRISPR-Cas9 as a therapy in patients. The CRISPR-Cas9 technology was co-invented in my PhD lab at the University of California, Berkeley, and many consider it to be one of the biggest breakthroughs of the last couple decades. But five years ago, when I started my PhD with Jennifer Doudna, CRISPR wasn't a technology at all. It was virtually unheard of, and it was a peculiarity found in bacteria. So I want to tell you how we got here today. The CRISPR story really begins in 1987. Some Japanese scientists were analyzing the DNA sequence of a bacterium called E. coli that populates our intestines. And they made a bizarre discovery. Buried in the genome of E. coli was a region of DNA unlike anything that had ever been seen before. A series of repeats with the same 28 letters of DNA repeating over and over and over again, like some kind of copying mistake. Now, this wasn't just true of E. coli. By the 2000s, scientists had found those same bizarre repeats in half of all bacteria. And so they were given a name, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, or CRISPRs for short. Now, something this widespread in nature must have functional importance. And the first clues for that function came just a few years later, when an even more surprising discovery was made. Buried within those repeats, between those repeating letters were short snippets of DNA that had been stolen from viruses. Now, what were they doing there? Well, they came not from viruses that infect humans, but bacteria-specific viruses, also known as bacteriophages, which means eaters of bacteria. These viruses are the most prevalent life form on our planet, numbering at around 10 million trillion trillion. They outnumber even bacteria 10 to 1. From this picture, you can see a cell being bombarded by these viral particles, which have legs to latch onto the cell surface, a head where the DNA is stored, and pumps that inject that DNA into the cell, just like a hypodermic syringe. Now, faced with this persistent threat, bacteria have had billions of years of evolution to develop defense strategies. And scientists thought that short snippets of viral DNA in the CRISPR might represent a new immune system. Well, the proof came from a yogurt company, of all places. Food scientists there were studying Streptococcus thermophilus. It's the key ingredient to make yogurt, mozzarella cheese, and other dairy products. And they wanted to improve the viral, the viral resistance of their strains. Well, their strains had their own CRISPR, and the scientists found that those strains were completely immune to any viruses that had matching DNA in the CRISPR. On top of that, if they infected those strains with new viruses that didn't have a match, the cells could adapt. They could evolve themselves during the infection by stealing new pieces of DNA from the, from the virus and splicing it into the CRISPR, gaining new modes of immunity. Now, scientists were shocked to discover this phenomenon. And really, the CRISPRs are functioning like a molecular vaccination card where they can store memories from past infections in their own genome 
to use that information to recognize any viruses during a reinfection. I like to think of CRISPRs as being like a microscopic version of what store owners might do to prevent shoplifting. By pasting pictures of shoplifters behind the cash registers, those pictures can be used to identify and deny entry to any repeat offenders. The mugshots enable facial recognition in the exact same way that CRISPRs enable DNA recognition. Now, to actually destroy the virus, bacteria use a molecular complex called CRISPR-Cas9. I spent my PhD figuring out how this machine works. And to put it simply, it functions like a pair of precision-guided molecular scissors. Any DNA from a virus that enters the cell gets targeted, where that matching sequence gets sliced in half so that the rest of the viral DNA can be degraded and the infection cleared. To cut that DNA in half, CRISPR-Cas9 relies on two principal components, a protein enzyme called Cas9 and a molecule of ribonucleic acid, or RNA. The CRISPR RNA is like a photocopy of the CRISPR DNA. It can attach itself to matching DNA sequences from the virus using the same base pairs that hold the DNA double helix together. And when that match is formed, Cas9 gets recruited to cut the DNA in half. The RNA functions like the crosshairs that specify the GPS coordinates for this attack, and Cas9 is the weapon that actually eliminates the target. What makes this machine so effective is that it's easily programmable. By swapping in and out new sequences of RNA, CRISPR can program Cas9 to target and cut up virtually any DNA sequence that enters the cell. Scientists were thrilled to discover this immune system, and they put it to use right away. If you've had yogurt in the past year, chances are that you've consumed strains of Streptococcus thermophilus whose CRISPR DNA was expanded with the exact experiments that I just described. But the real breakthrough came when we and others realized what would be possible if we could harness the power of CRISPR-Cas9 to cut DNA, but repurpose it in different kinds of cells, including human cells, to edit the genome. Now, to understand how this would work, you first have to appreciate that the DNA inside our own cells is being cut up all the time by UV light exposure, carcinogens, even during egg and sperm cell formation. And to deal with those persistent cuts, our cells have evolved the ability to repair broken DNA. Well, scientists realized we could take advantage of that process. If we could design an enzyme to cut the genome in just one place, then we could bias the cell to repair that broken site, but to do so in the way of our choosing. For example, if we used molecular scissors to cut at or near the site of a genetic mutation, then we could supply the cell with a repair template to fix that site using new DNA, replacing a faulty sequence with a corrected sequence. Now, designing those molecular scissors was the limiting step, was the real challenge for a long time. How do you get an enzyme to target one site in a genome made up of more than three billion letters and to do that specifically and efficiently. The beauty is that nature has already solved this problem in bacteria. In the exact same way that bacteria use CRISPR-Cas9 to target and cut viral DNA sequences, we can now use CRISPR and program it in the lab to target and cut human DNA to edit the genome virtually anywhere we'd like. My favorite analogy for CRISPR-Cas9 is the find and replace function in Microsoft Word. If you know what spelling mistake you need to fix, you can use the same letters of the misspelled word as a search term to find and fix those mistakes anywhere in the document. In the exact same way, CRISPR-Cas9 allows us to find and replace spelling mistakes in the genetic document that is our genome. And we do this using a search term made of RNA, where the letters simply need to match the letters of DNA we'd like to fix. Designing that RNA can be done in minutes on a computer, and introducing RNA together with Cas9 into cells can be done in just days. CRISPR-Cas9 has been a remarkably effective tool to engineer the genome of cells, but it's also worked in just about every plant and animal it's been tested in. Since 2012, there have been reports of specific genetic changes made in everything ranging from mice, pigs, and monkeys to rice, tomatoes, and soybeans. These efforts are giving us more and more precise models for human disease, 
and they offer the promise of new improved GMOs. Now, the next frontier will be really using this tool to improve human health. Can we achieve this ultimate goal of curing a genetic disease at its source, at the level of DNA, instead of just treating the downstream symptoms? Imagine a future in which we use stem cell technology together with CRISPR-Cas9 to remove diseased cells from a patient, repair them in the lab, and then transplant those corrected cells back into the body. Clinical trials are already underway that offer a cure for HIV AIDS by editing the DNA in blood cells taken from HIV positive patients. And I expect we're gonna see more and more clinical trials with CRISPR entering the pipeline in the next few years. What really got folks speaking this past year was the report in May that for the first time ever, scientists used CRISPR-Cas9 to edit the DNA in human embryos. And this was possible using a protocol that had already worked in monkeys, a combination of in vitro fertilization with the micro-injection of CRISPR-Cas9 into fertilized egg cells. And unlike therapy in adult patients, this would introduce heritable changes that could be passed on to subsequent generations. You can imagine the controversy that this has provoked. And many fear that this technology could be abused, that it would usher in an era of eugenics or designer babies where a select few could pick and choose the best genes for their offspring. Others would say if we deny unborn children a technology that could ease human suffering or eradicate a disease, it would be immoral. And then still others seek to reach a middle ground where we draw a red line between disease prevention, something we should strive for, and genetic enhancement, something that should remain off limits. CRISPR-Cas9 is forcing us to rethink what kind of world we want to live in. And there are weighty ethical issues to discuss about how we should use this technology and how it should be regulated. But I wanted to end by providing some perspective from my own journey with CRISPR. I'm still amazed that this technology has exploded as rapidly as it has, when just a few years ago, this was a seemingly insignificant research topic with absolutely no human health relevance. This year, there were conferences all around the world dedicated to CRISPR and genome editing. But at the beginning of my PhD, I can remember presenting at conferences, dropping the word CRISPR, and getting just blank stares in return. But for my colleagues and I, that just didn't matter. CRISPR was this fascinating topic with big questions and exciting possibilities, and so we dove in without thinking twice. Science is full of these stories of serendipitous discovery. And for me, it's the surprise factor that makes basic research so fundamentally important and so exciting. Nobody can predict where the next breakthroughs will come from. The best we can do is follow our curiosity wherever it takes us. Who knows what other amazing tools and technologies nature has in store for us, waiting to be uncovered. Thank you.